everybody this is ramanuj from lossico and today we have sivoni sagar with us and we are going to talk about a lot of things including um, uh, especially about renegotiation of contracts during a uh, pandemic and and the a lot of contractual breaches that are happening just a moment all right so uh, i think we are ready to begin now sorry for the slight delay uh, we are live on youtube as well uh okay so let's just get started hi sivoni why don't you start by telling us about yourself you have been a general counsel in several multinational companies and then now you are also working uh, at at i believe at star india yeah and and so why don't you talk about uh, talk about your uh, career journey a little so that people have a bit of context and then we can start on the subject okay um I'm going to talk about my career journey, and then Ramnath, give me a little context on what our general audience is, so that I'm catering to also understanding what we're really talking about here. Um, the little background: I've uh, been a general counsel at uh, various uh, multinational companies, as well as counsel to Indian companies. Um, a bit of my career, I've spent teaching and taking. Uh, classes around more uh, negotiation collaborative negotiation really moving towards the area of mediation um i practiced as a mediator and continue to be a mediator um enrolled with the supreme court mediation and conciliation committee and yes i'm currently uh, working with star india i i also want to give you as well as your guests a caveat that nothing that we're talking about here is either connected to or related to the entertainment industry or anything remotely connected with the business i work with we're discussing this um as a more not academic but a practical and somebody who's been working in the field of mediation i'm coming to it from that perspective of course uh if you can if you can uh, also tell us a bit about uh, what's going on really in the industry uh, there are a lot of breaches obviously for obvious reasons there are uh, contracts which cannot be performed right now because of uh, you know the lockdown pandemic uh, supply chain disruption at the same time there is a lot of uh, worry that people are facing right now about uh, you know how things will uh, return to normal and when it will return to normal and that is also not clear people are saying we don't know whether we are in the beginning of the pandemic or in the middle or somewhere towards the end not not clear at all and uh, from that perspective also there is a there is a sense that is slowly coming uh, is dawning on people that we have to live with this it's not going to go away and we cannot behave like you know we just shut down everything and hope that it will get over because it's not getting over so uh, and there is no no relent you know there is nothing the the spread has not slowed down even if it is slowed down it hasn't stopped in any way and the moment you leave the lockdown it will be back to square one from the looks of things so uh, even during lockdown we haven't made much you know it's not like we have been able to contain it effectively or not only in india this is the global picture so what what do you think from that perspective is the how is the industry industry reacting and how is that uh, impacting the way courts and and the legal system will look at contract contracts of breach okay that's a lot of questions ramanuj apart from being a lawyer i will need to do some crystal ball gazing and an astrologer so i'm going to just try to take this one at a time yeah um sure sure, I, sure. you know to set it out a bit in context I, i think you've talked about a lot of things and maybe if we if we park but, some but, of but 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 i'm sure that sivun you this is like something you have to regularly do as a general counsel or as a senior counsel anywhere you have to do crystal ball glazing and and a lot of astrology no doubt about it <laughs> <laughs> you're right but uh, i the, the difference today and this is what we probably how how we started talking about this entire renegotiation of contracts and speaking to a lot of uh counsel and students about where we're going is that today um i'm not crystal ball gazing uh, for a singular client yes 
like I already gave you a caveat, I'm not right now talking about my, my employer, however I'm talking about how we're looking at it. I think we talked about a lot of things and a lot of these things are the sum of um, are the parts of the whole. The fact is you're not sitting at your home and only thinking about when will my tap go off. That is one of your largest concerns, but you have a much larger concern with the fact that the current pandemic has pretty much brought most economies to a halt. So when we're talking most economies, we're talking about this at a much larger scale. And going to a problem usually, I think one of the things we think about when we're going to a problem is we say, don't try to keep looking at the entire problem because then you won't be able to solve it. However, the current state somehow requires us to focus very much on the issues that either as business people or lawyers advising business people or ourselves, uh, organizations, people, uh, associations involved in various forms of contract, we are concerned. So we're focusing on exactly what we're concerned with. But there is a larger concern, as you rightly put it, as to are we in the beginning of this? Are we in the middle of this? Are we at the end of this? I, I, I mean, I, 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 my point was I don't have that crystal ball gazing. When I'm looking at this currently, I'm looking today to discuss this around that we have a lockdown which fundamentally has really closed down most industry, production, service provision, and there's a potential future slowdown which is going to have a consequential adverse effect on contractual ob obligations. I'm saying that simplistically. Contractual obligations are multifarious. They're not between just two parties, they involve a lot of parties. So if you look at it, I mean, where are we with COVID? It's right now it's 213 countries impacted, 2.5 million cases just of the infection, which has its collateral damage. Pretty much all industry had shut down, uh, devastating consequences between health, uh, social fabric, uh, governance and economy. Uh, lockdown of industry, restricted personal movement, social distancing, overwhelmed systems, starting with healthcare, essential services, massive shift to virtual working. I think this puts it at a, at a, at a nutshell. To break this down, when I was thinking, where are we going with this? We're looking at a multi, they're, they're, I'm not going to try to make a list here, but for example, we have restrictions of, on goods, services, and personnel. We have disruption of supply chain, almost 80% disruption. Even essential services doesn't cover more than 20. We have obstruction in contracts that are multilateral, bilateral, term sheets, agreements, agreements that are contingent upon other agreements, circumstances of standstill for no fault of either party. Now I'm gonna do lawyers speak. Commercial disruption, commercial loss, social disruption, social loss, which means talent, employment, ecosystem. This is pretty much where we're at. The crystal ball gazing really talks about understanding what are, what are, what, what is the background that we are now going to be functioning in. And I think if we just take a step back and for this conversation, start thinking about contractual obligations we need to ask ourselves some big questions, whether we're sitting on a table for between a lesser and a lessee or at a much larger table, there's some very fundamental questions here. Um, are we looking at continuity of business or are we looking at, I mean, no one looks at failure of business, but coming to it from that point of view. So are we looking at discharge of all our obligations and all contracts and termination or do we have an awareness around, are we taking the action that is most effective for continuation of business as in when business opens? So everyone, every industry is at a different stage. Um, are we aware of the options that are valuable to enable the bounce back of our own business cycle in plain sign of, line of sight of the, our capacity and ability of all our stakeholders to participate in that business cycle? So if you are a manufacturer of, two-wheelers, you're not just thinking about manufacturing two-wheelers, 
There's a very large ecosystem, which includes your contracts with employers, contracts with suppliers, distributors, transporters, responses of the customers, marketing arrangements. Is there a need for marketing? It's a larger picture. The third thing, are we asking questions and creating options for what is possible right now? Because every industry, every player, every, contra every contracting party, every business, uh, industry, society is going to start looking at those options from a person point, from contractual points of view. And um, we're going to segue into some of this, where they're going to want to know uh, what is, in, in light of what we want our outcome to be, is it prudent to look at, um, I'm going to throw these terms in and we're going to come back to them. We're talking a lot about force majeure and frustration of contracts. Now, when you start thinking of your outcome, you start thinking of exactly how to deploy those things or actually are they relevant or how would you use them? Yes, they're relevant, how would you use them? And uh, the fourth leg of this, which is important is execution validity. Are we making decisions or looking for solutions in light of business continuity and otherwise that will be executable? And then when we take actions, will they be upheld by the rest of society? Got it. I mean, so, does this give you, it's a, it's a very large picture. I'm giving, it's a large canvas. I mean, I want, yeah, to, I want to just, you know, draw out the canvas a little bit more. So I have, uh, you know, so as, as a lawyer, I think this is a very interesting time because uh, more than your usual legal things right now, you have to apply a lot of your, like you said, crystal ball gazing in terms of how things are going to pan out. Because, for example, if you think that uh, your things are going to get to normal in the next three months, then you'll have a different approach if you think that, no, no, things are going to be a very different scenario for the next one year. Or that, you know, uh, so, so it depends entirely, right? If, if, if you think, if you imagine an economic doomsday scenario, you'll be planning in a very different way. And not only planning, it will reflect in your legal documents, in your legal strategy. So how do lawyers deal with that part? Because it is easy to talk about at least law, which is there in the law books. But I think everybody is out of depth here that uh, normally we take business conditions. They are not this level of uh, fluid or, or this level of uncertainty is not there. But now that you have a complete uncertain situations, uh, how do lawyers work with their clients? How do lawyers advise their business uh, colleagues? Okay. So just, just for the purpose of our, our conversation, so that it's not entirely vague, either for you or for this audience, and has some, you know, I'm going to take a pragmatic view, because this is not about, you know, joking about whether we're crystal ball gazing. There is every scientist, every health expert, uh, economic expert with their hands up in the air today. So I'm not, I'm not actually going to try to be highly strategic here. Fundamentally, I do. I function as a strategist. And a strategy requires, it has a great amount of ambiguity. Everything is not always clear. However, you, like you rightly said, you have line of sight of the kind of timeline that you're looking at, right? Today, when you're not looking at a timeline, I have a question to pose. I don't intend for everybody to answer it, but at least think about it. What as I asked you, the question right now is, what do I want today, currently? It is the most present time that we've ever been asked to act upon. Even against our best judgment, we are, our requirement to be, in order to be effective, our requirement is not to over strategize out ourselves. I have the greatest respect for the opinions that I've heard in the last four weeks on uh, the law around force majeure, the law it, uh, around frustration. I'm happy to go over some of that. However, I, you know, I, I've, been, I've given this some thought and like I laid out to you, really first ask yourself those four questions. Even as a lawyer, as, a, as an advisor, what is the outcome that you need and want? So now let me tell you, if the economy was going to be back in three to six months, or we were in doomsday, as you called it, I'm imagining most people would have very different scenarios. A lot of people would be just giving away their business, for better or for worse. 
However, understanding that you have, for the first time, been in the same place and faced with um, a very uncertain outcome, you want to start looking at at your at your contracts, at your obligations, as well as your continuing your business with an immediate term, not relying entirely on other things that most people actually don't have around certainty. So when we make a contract, usually, say for example, um, a project, a project works contract, you look at three to five to 15 year horizons. The idea here is not to say, don't look at those horizons. It's how are you looking at them? And today, what, what we're talking about is, Currently, the situation that we're in where there's mostly breakdown of contracts. So what are your options for that? Now, very simply, um, I'll give you an idea. Now, there's, there's warning bells from every side. The IMF has sounded a very high risk of bankruptcy and layoffs. That's going to spiral the eco economic crisis. Governments are looking to provide economic stimulus from the US to the, to the EU, to the UK. We have an economic stimulus pra um, package. We're still looking at a much more um, pragmatic industry package. We right now have a more of a hunger and food and basic necessities package, which is what we needed, which was our need of the hour. However, COVID is a game changer. It's, you, we are yet to see whether this will upend the entire law and prevailing principles on force majeure, frustration of contracts due to impossibility currently. Now, uh, the courts now haven't yet taken a view. We have one or two or three ways that we would, we would go in. Uh, one of the superior courts will at some point be faced with and, and interpret the contract. We have very good interpretation on frustration and on force majeure, but to understand how it's going to be applicable in the current facts and circumstances. Um, now, I'll, I'll give you an example. I think Delhi High Court heard um, um, Halliburton, if I'm not mistaken, or two parties, and stayed the invocation of a bank guarantee, very clearly saying that they are doing this on grounds of special equities to prevent irretrievable harm, right? Now, there is a background to this. Uh, for a bank guarantee to we stayed from invocation, you fundamentally have to either show fraud or irreparable harm. And here they've added special equities and make the note saying that the countrywide lockdown is prima facie in the nature of a force majeure. Even when, this is my understanding, because there haven't been any judgments to go with, even when there is a judgment, fundamentally, we already have the principles very clear on force majeure and, and frustration. Uh, however, each and every one of them will be to their facts and circumstances. And that brings us back entirely to understanding what our alternatives are, right? So our alternatives are a court gives an interpretation of frustration of force majeure. Um, I think I'm seeing some flashing. Do people want me to get into what frustration and force majeure is at this point? There are some questions. Uh, we we will take up questions. There are a lot of questions on YouTube. Give me a couple of minutes. If it's getting too... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, no ask, ask yeah, yeah. We'll get to Because the there is, there is, you see, it's going to take a lot more than one hour to get into this whole dialogue. There's excellent writing from some very superior minds on what is frustration, what is force majeure. Let's just keep it simple. Very simplistically. There are nuances in this. Force majeure is a civil law concept. Uh, it is mostly mentioned and referred to as an interpreted concept from the civil law in a contract. Uh, frustration is something that comes under Section 56 of our Indian Contract Act. It's mostly in common law. It's a positive law. It allows, it, it gives you the opportunity to render a contract discharged on account of impossibility. Let's just keep that simple. Make it simple we can render a contract void because of impossibility. There is nuances of interpretation there as well. I'm just going to go back into where we were, where we were going with this. So you have a superior court that will interpret this or, or there is a possibility of the government uh, issuing either a bill, a statute, an ordinance in whatever form to determine the state of contract. <clears throat> and that's, excuse me, that's happened in uh, 
I need to catch up Germany and Singapore currently in order to give some rest where they basically stopped the clock in order for businesses not to be able to go headlong into each other. Yeah, they have basically um, created some statutes. They have passed some law saying that, you know, for the time being, the clock stops. And until this is not over, you know, there is no, like nothing happens. The contracts are frozen in time. As in, you will not use those those three months to uh, to basically contribute. They will not be the contributors towards either damages or liability or breach and so on and so forth. Now, that is one mechanism. It was in. It was a quick response of very highly commercial um, uh, economies. They understand this. Let's just say we're not there right now. That's not even the point. Point is, even in the face of a superior court's interpretation, for which we have the highest respect, we, we respond to precedent and or a statute, the fact remains that each contract ranging from a lesser and a lessee sitting across a table to a highly complex contract were it to be discharged or otherwise contended or in a contentious litigation before a court would then need to be heard to its own facts and circumstances. So in that, in the face of that, I think the discussion that I've probably had with a couple of students as well as with you is thinking about how effective at this point and practical, because I'm not here talking fundamentally of the law. And Dr. Singh, we spoke very well about the law and the, the the tracing of the law. It's about what, where are we practically? So practically, we're at a place where renegotiation of contracts is probably the highest probability. And with renegotiation, the concept of using mediation to address these issues. Now, like this is not a medicine, even, even before COVID, this is not a medicine that applies across the board. You have to see we go back to the five questions that we asked. What do you want your outcome to be? How do you see it? Like you said, do you see this as a three month or as an Armageddon? You and me might have very different views. We're hardly going to take a standard view in, in view of which we are going to actually decide our entire fate. So for example, I'll give you, I'll, I'll just go down some, some very fundamental stuff. When you are faced with a breach, or an issue, you do something called contractual due diligence as a business. Okay. Uh, 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 Ramanuj, why don't we just do this every day for a week? Because I can answer all these questions. Yeah. Anyway. So, in fact, we have a, I, before, I actually, let's just take a pause. I'll request all the, all of the, everybody in the audience to introduce yourselves and tell us where you're logging in from and tell us about the interesting cases that you're coming across. Please contribute, like share it in the chat. You know, if you are come, you, any interesting judgment you have noticed, uh, you can share links, you can share your short comments on it. Uh, any particular observations you have shared in the chat, it's open, everybody can see your chat. So it, it, would, it would add to the discussion. But yeah, I mean, we'll continue the conversation for the time being and we'll take questions we'll take later on. And, uh, later the on. ones that I can. Sure, okay. sure. Uh, so, yeah. So what would we do at the outset? So now I've just set out for you the second canvas now, that these are our options. In any event, as a lawyer or as a business person or somebody who's advising, you would do what you, what you call your own contractual due diligence with a view to analyze and take some steps. Now, let, we won't get into too many discussions because I'm going to drop some things which I think everyone will understand, but you'll have to fundamentally understand why they become important. It's like in my head, what we would do as checklists. You'd look at the proper law of the contract. Why does it become important? Because we do many, many, you know, in India itself, there are many states. We're always looking at jurisdiction. We're now running across issues that are, is it, um, is it, in, is it an Indo-China contract, Indo-France contract? Will we have force majeure? Will we have frustration? These are for nuances, but you identify it for the better purpose of understanding which train you're going to possibly catch. Right? Then you scrutinize your contracts to determine whether pandemics are even covered. Right? Even if they weren't covered, then you would go into the next stream. You would go into impossibility and frustration, for example. Right? Um, I'll come back to why, 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 why I say whether pandex, pandemics are covered. Then, as a, as a business or a layperson, anybody would chart their own risks and liabilities with clear line of sight of loss. You want to understand what's in my control, what's outside my control. 
you want to challenge that notion is it in my control or not because that then allows you to start thinking what my action will be you then have to remember that even in these especially force majeure there is something called the duty of mitigation even for impossibility there is a fundamental duty of mitigation you have to start understanding before you run down a path are you taking the actions on your duty of mitigation before you get into a contentious path yeah or whatever your next you are in breach today or you are in breach tomorrow you also have to understand the issues that can be addressed with unilateral intervention and what i mean by that is in this kind of a scenario most people are thinking business they're not listening to counsel that let's go and sue somebody you're thinking first i'm going to survive then i'm going to make it to a court i imagine right so you're thinking bootstrapping compliance relaxation opening potential um phase opening so on and so forth and then there are aspects that require multilateral intervention contracting parties so on and so forth so here parties might be better placed to some of them after they've seen what decided between force majeure on these actions to taking a practical approach and that practical approach we'll go over it at any point but looks at looking at non adversarial mechanisms like we discussed free negotiation there is a pattern that you follow for that as well that's what you expect from your counsel uh, you can't uh, you it's very hard as we've learned to spiral into conflict and then spiral the conflict back at a time when you're actually just trying to open the key to your business so uh, that that's another question that you know uh, that i can me. think of that what happens if a lot of people try to go to the court at once because people would have their capitals locked out in different disputes and everybody goes to the court there would be millions of cases like you know almost every contract would then be up for a litigation or arbitration I, the probably the system is not ready to handle such kind of pressure so can you talk about that is that is something that lawyers have to take into account for their clients before they advise them on on frustration or you know that okay claim that your contract is barred by force majeure etc yeah i'm smiling cuz you know it's my favorite topic i sometimes wonder i go backwards in my four step theory i was asked what's your execution ability right so that answers a lot of your questions we have a lot of people i'm sure on your call i'm sure in many of our forums where we'll discuss this that have been going to court for the last 10 years and it's 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 a very exciting space to be intellectually and to lay down the law however when you're in business you take practical decisions right and it's not just about capital it's not as in as in financial capital it's human capital it's human capital financial capital time use of that resource all of these three resources how would you be using them at this time to the possibility of um a gain from a transacting party that is as stuck as you are i mean you don't have to bleeding you're in commerce you don't have to be a bleeding heart but you have to understand whether they have the ability when you hypothetically win this case to in fact actually service your win these are also decisions that you take and absolutely like you rightly said again this is a view when you start looking at it in those four things we were talking about what i was saying awareness and outcome you also start understanding what the nuances to your fact situation are does your business run on a vertically integrated platform i i don't know how many do right you're fundamentally even when you're vertically integrated you have a supply chain from somewhere the human end the consumer is one big part of your supply i mean your your entire chain right their ability to purchase today there what is the market you are going to be looking at larger scenarios which probably have practically less plays for a contentious meeting of the wills around a contract that has to be contested or excused or discharged on force majeure or um frustration because after all lawyers we will go back into our thin domains and look at technically where will we fall business people will largely want to understand practically where will we fall one two the the state of my business today whether i open 1% 10% or 20% relies on relationships and stakeholders 
And what is my ability to maintain, salvage, or continue with those relationships will become a very large part of that decision as well. So it's not just resource. It's also, you know, there was a time when this was very soft peddling. Today, it's not. Today, when you're faced with a three-month opening or an Armageddon and probably 40% of the economy being wiped, you are thinking of uh, your ability to restart your chain, your relationship, because after all, that's actually going to determine whether you can actually service this entire, your business. Am I answering yeah, your question? Yeah, that, that makes sense. So basically, what I'm hearing is that, you know, uh, right now, people have to really worry about business continuity. And even when things open up, they'll have to make, keep it running. And the situation is such that if you, you don't want to fight with all of, all of your vendors, you don't want to fight with all of your suppliers, you don't want to fight with all your clients, even if they haven't paid, right? And people are in very similar situations. So if you're in a business where all your clients are not able to pay, let's say you're an advertising agency, and suddenly all of your clients are unable to pay their, you know, their all main manufacturing and their manufacturing is shut down. They're not able to pay. So on one hand, you're trying to get new clients, but you know that these clients would come back at some point when some of them may go under the water, but then there's nothing you can do. Even then, if they're going under the water, they're not going to pay your bills even now. There's no litigation you can do. You can get a judgment that, okay, you know, I should be paid. But in the end, how will you enforce the judgment if they are going under? And if they are not going underwater, then you want them to come back and not have this bad blood that in during a difficult time you uh, you know filed cases against us. And of course, I'm not going to come back to you as a client anymore. So okay. these things are of paramount importance for most businesses right now. So uh, so we can understand that there would be certain things which will land into litigation and disputes and other things people would try to at least postpone any kind of disputes and watch, take, 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 a, uh, you know, observe and watch kind of approach that, okay, is this actually, is this account actually turning bad or is it just a temporary setback? So I think that's going to happen. And uh, so what, what, what is the sense? Like, how do you see like, uh, you know, is there any formula or is kind of principle we can apply here? to understand which kind of contracts are likely to land into dispute. Because a lot of lawyers would be very interested in knowing that. That, you know, what kind of matters are going to land into dispute. You know, um, okay, here's the thing. Throw some in me. I, I'll tell you why there's no formula, Ramanuj. I'll tell you no, why. There's no formula, formula, but there must be some principle that, as say, say for example, if I was a general counsel, then I'm looking at my matters. There are certain things I know I have to take to litigation, and there are other. Luckily, I'm not a general counsel. I'm just saying, if this is a, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about myself, imagining myself from home. So obviously, I would ha have to come up with. So if there are like you know, a uh, ten thousand contract breaches right now, and I have to take some kind of a strategy that going forward, next three months, next six months, how am I going to deal with all these contracts that have been breached? I, I think the council's underlying principle is led by business. The first thing each and every business mm -hmm. does is understands its dependency and codependency with its stakeholders. Number one. So I might, my, there's a side of me, the academic and, you know, the conflict academic side of me that, that, that sees conflict as such a, such, a, such a generic thing. But I realize it's a fact situation based fundamentally. Businesses are codependent on supply chains. And they can't be a rule of thumb because you find your only rule of thumb is your outlook and approach to terming the pandemic as a force majeure event or not will probably be consistent, right? You have an outlook or approach because you will find yourself on both sides of the fence. You will be a supplier somewhere and you will be the customer somewhere. Now, you will be subject to both pretty much how where the government of India found itself when we looked at our procurement rules and decided to term the pandemic a force majeure event. Because the term pandemic, by the way, is not even defined in our contract in any event. Uh, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I don't have a sense. I'm giving you a sense of where I'm coming from. I don't have information, but I think the government also came from a place where it was leaving the doors open for renegotiation. It's very interesting. It has terms in its public procurement manual which allow you to change the basic price to a very late date. 
All that means is that when something like this happens, supposing your day of contract was 1st of March, right? You're going to say everything's in shutdown. That date itself has moved to the 1st of September. So the price parity that I went on for 1st of March, I'll be able to change. Governments do this often. I'm sure the government of India does this as well often. But their procurement contract has a fundamental built-in for renegotiation. So are we going to have a rule of thumb? I'm trying to think about the people that I've, I've been speaking with. It's not a rule of thumb. I think across a business, right? I'm going to steer away from my own business because I just can't. But let's say manufacturing even. You have export orders. You have uh, domestic demands to be met. Are you going to take a yardstick and have you been able to formulate formula? No. All council right now are sitting with sleeves up and pretty much doing contract management from, from scratch to understand what's the liability, what's the relationship, what's the, what, okay, one of the large things you'll do is big ticket items versus small ticket items. You can't take a different view to all of them, right? Whether you're a small or a large business or a company, you can't play with one rule with one person, another rule with the other person. So your fundamental yeah. rule is going to be. So initially uh, we are seeing a wave of litigation, I believe around a lot of finance contracts and bank guarantees and, you know, export kind of contracts. So where, you know, there are an advance has been paid, people are trying to claim it back. So there are certain things definitely, which is seeing like an immediate kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing, pledged shares. I think that the government, I mean, the Supreme Court's extension of limitation, um, suspension of the Bankruptcy Act for three months. These are measures that will address, you know, for all counsel here, these are addressing corporate counsel's larger questions. Larger, not the bigger, as in not the wider questions, not the, not the heavy questions. It's addressing at least, do am I out of time to file or do I have a current pending obligation or liability at my head? You know, in these are going to be where you're going to look at institutional contracts, like you said, finance, bank guarantees, so on and so forth. However, also things like perishable goods and stuff where it is stuck in. in yes. The yeah. mm -hmm. Perishable goods. I mean, now we're 50 days into the lockdown. Everyone's on shutdown. So you have basically shut down the chain. And no one judgment is going to release you from having to pretty much address, and I don't mean renegotiate does not mean change the terms or suddenly excuse everybody, everything that they owed you. Renegotiations are very, very strictly under the law as well. They're taking into cognizance what our rights and liabilities were, and then looking at the potential of being able to create a new paradigm. Does that answer your question? Because I don't think there's rules around for, I'm just trying to think which companies have a rule, like say, say the petroleum companies, do you think they have a rule? No, not a rule, but obviously you have to come up with people are innovating in the situation, given that if you imagine no, nobody has ever been in a situation that 10,000 contracts at once have been like breached, you know, and exactly. it's, it, there's a breakdown. It's not even a breach. There's a, you know, so breakdown yes, in 10,000 you, you are going to do, you're going to do bunching of contracts to understand the ones that can, you can take one line of view, say, for example, deferment of payment or um, you're not going to waive anything, but you're going to deferment or sharing of obligations. I've seen some very innovative stuff where um, retail landlords are agreeing to whenever they open to a, a profit share as opposed to a rental, because there is no line of sight of being able to give a rental in the, in the absence of any business. Now, these are things that do not involve the courts. And you start realizing, so if I was looking at a bunch of, say, 10,000 contracts, I would take out the ones that logically, commercially, socially, and looking at a wide range between, like you said, three months and Armageddon, allows me to renegotiate and put my teams to renegotiate. Now, sure. most businesses have a complex web. They have services, vendors, product suppliers. So you have to look at, what you first have to do is look at core business, collateral, as in everything else that 
a core business, services and supplies to business, and then the collaterals. And then you will have an approach to it. I, I, my fundamental sense is a lot of this approach will be around renegotiation. Yeah, so basically, there is already a lot of uncertainty and rather than adding more uncertainty, going to court in India is extremely uncertain. Even arbitration is uncertain. You, you do, the uncertainty is not only about outcome, but even how long it will take. So the businesses are not finding it very convenient to take on more, uh, more uncertainty and rather, you know, you can kind of preclude the uncertainty by going into a renegotiation and coming up, coming up with a new document. And to think of it, if you have renegotiated a new document, there's a higher chance that it will stand in court or courts will take a favorable view rather than having a document which was pre covid right? So... No, the thing is, so we have, we have very well settled principles. And like I said to you before, it's going to run its course. Now, we have settled principles on force majeure, frustration, impossibility, discharge. You basically have to prove the impossibility, prove the discharge. You'll have one set of cases. How will the fallout be? The people who are watching in the sidelines for the case to come through also do not understand that if they are seen, that this is seen as an impossibility, the natural course, of, the natural course will be discharge because they don't want to discharge all their contracts. So you'll only enter into that line and side, stand on the side of that court or in line if you are confident you want to discharge. Most people right now might not want to discharge, discharge of contract, right? So the, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. That's to answer your question on the process itself, the uncertainty of business mired by the uncertainty of contentious litigation Mired by the uncertainty of the person in case you win. Hopefully, we take charge and we have special courts. So in any event, you win and then you're going to take, you don't want to draw blood from stone because that person may or may not exist in the same avatar. Whereas you may have the opportunity today to be reconstructing that. And that brings me to where I think this might lie. The reconstruction can be of contracts, renegotiation, will often need to be with third parties because that gives you a different view altogether. Of what's possible, if you're if you're in a contention, every every business will have a different different view on this. Right. So, uh, in terms of uh, like one thing is clear that you know a view across the industry would be emerging that you know rather go into renegotiation and mediation and conciliation rather than going into arbitration, which uh, arbitration is a last resort and going to court it will be even more difficult than arbitration so so that is the situation here and so of of course many litigation lawyers won't be happy but is there any reason for the litigation lawyers to be happy some things will end up in court right no no one second so here's my view and mm -hmm. there's a practicality to this view litigation lawyer is a lawyer who goes to court a litigation lawyer is also a lawyer who represents his client in a contentious suit, right? Yes. A litigation lawyer, and I've dealt with many of them, have the same ability to be sitting in that renegotiation because they understand the nuances of what a court's outcome will be, what they would be possibly looking at, how this would probably play out, what jurisdictions we may have to go to. So they have as much a seat on the table Right. So they it's need to they need to only. look at right. It's not corporate lawyers only, but litigation they, lawyers need to step up and start getting into negotiations. In fact, mostly in mediations, even commercial mediations, litigating lawyers come. In mediation, but not really in negotiation. Negotiating contracts is not always a, something that. Uh, Which is fine. I think that there is every skill right now for even a litigating lawyer to start looking at the contentious process as a creative process. Okay. That there is the one, the one-sided win may produce a precedent or a principle. That would be great, but there'll be about 10 lawyers doing that. The 20,000 other lawyers would be following that. And when they're following it, many of them will also be possibly forced to tell their clients, we should probably get into a conciliatory or a mediation approach. And we should approach that, you know, there were, there were, there was, that's how you had local dalats and stuff. I, I foresee that. I think you're going to have large banking lo local dalats. You're going to have large settlements. 
How else are you going to actually be able to address a multitude of issues? Many, many banking issues, even coming from the retail side, are not going to be addressed by each and every court or regulator or tribunal. They will give you a principle. After all, a litigating lawyer is also going to have to advise their client that now this is how the principle applies to us. No? Right, right. Makes sense. So uh, how do you think the banking industry is going to do? Because we had we had a terrible, difficult situation already. And now in now almost every loan is running into difficulty. So in that case, how do you think? And the, India's NBFC sector was also under a bit of trouble, but there have been a lot of new age uh, uh, fintech companies which are, which are getting into lending in a big way. So how do you think all of this is going to play out in the coming months? And, and all, especially what will happen to all these uh, finance contracts? Already India's uh, civil litigation system is largely crowded by banking and finance matters. So our estimate is around 60% of all civil matters or arbitration or any kind of litigation that is happening, non-criminal litigation, 60% of it is related to banking and finance. So what would happen going forward? Because if, I mean, they were still going to the court and getting some kind of relief before, but now that would not be possible. So what happens to those parties? The renegotiation, what is the possible kind of renegotiation, of course, given that many businesses are being cut off from their relationship? that the regulator was going possibly possibly going to form have the opportunity to form ombuds processes going to have to do it outside the courts going to have to pull back some of this litigation this extreme you know from from big ticket items to small ticket items the big ticket items are going before courts because they are fraught with fraud fraudulent activities uh, siphoning a uh, you know, mis misappropriation and claims such as that. Those cannot be really decided outside a court after all, because I don't think we've ever taken the criminal aspect of the law outside the courtroom, unless it already has a set principle. Once it has a set principle, you have a fine principle, you pay the fine, even a, even a, even a quasi-judicial body can be seen to summarily decide and investigate. The regulatory body, I think will probably have an expanded role beyond, you know, the, the economist side of this looks at it as let the economy run without the regulators. And then we're highly regulated. Today in a situation such as this, where we're going to now be at the cross section of compliance and management of financial institutions faced very squarely possibly with um, harm and damage by criminal or other civil actions, we're going to probably need a much wider regulatory body that's doing just financial. That's what I see. I must tell you, Ramanuj, though, that I, I don't fancy myself as a, as a financing, even, even in the litigation realm. Um, however, like I said, when you crystal ball gaze, you're looking at this as, as contention and possible solutions. This is what I see fundamentally. There is a very interesting and I think relevant question from Shruti Khanijo. She's asking, what is the possibility of Indian companies seeking third party funding because they would need, if they have to go into litigation, they might want third party funding. Sorry, repeat that. My apologies. I didn't uh, this is a question about third party funding. So if you are going into litigation in a situation like this, you might want to take third party funding, a concept which is not very popular in India yet. Uh, but is this something, but there are some instances where companies have got third party yes, funding. Yes, in the last two years, there's some very large law firms looking at third party funding. Um, I'm going to reserve my personal comments on this. Uh, it's an expansion of the contentious base. You can fund it the way you want to. The fact is, what is the result you're looking for? And currently, as we already discussed about half an hour ago, our issue lies at, yes, there are certain issues that will require the justice system to lay down the law because it's not been laid, for example. But then there are instances where you actually need to just run with the law and find your own way, which is what we're talking about renegotiation. Uh, third party funding is something that's a modality on how to handle this process. 
So yeah, of course, but it could gate, be uh, there may be certain uh, you know like certain uh, matters in which uh, there are deep pocketed uh, clients who are not paying or you know just delaying payments on small small reasons for small reasons. Do you think those cases could lead to some of the start party funding issues? Like of course, ma majority of them may not make sense, but even a small minority could uh, get that industry started in there. Uh, are you there, Siboni? Can you hear me? I think we have lost Simone for a moment. Her feed is lost. It's okay. No problem. Let's just uh, let, we'll just wait for her to join back. Siboni, can you hear us? If you can hear us, just say hi. We can. I think we lost your feed. Okay. So uh, there are a bunch of questions that I see right now. So there are questions about frustration. The question about lenders call an event of default under loan agreement as RBI COVID delivery package circular doesn't restrict this. I don't think they are going to call an event of default. It didn't really make sense. Uh, okay, I think we are we are waiting for Siboni. In the meanwhile, if anybody on, uh, in the session wants to come and Make a comment, most welcome. I can give you access to the mic. Any questions that you want to ask live? I think Siboni has joined us from another. Yeah, hi, I'm, hi, hi. I can yeah. use my phone for a bit. I'm having an electricity, um, I mean, um, um, internet connect problem. But let's no see. problem, no problem. Okay, we are having you back, so yeah. So yeah. there are a couple of very interesting, so we, we were talking about third party funding, you can hear what you said. So I was just saying that, do you think there will be a handful of cases in which third party funding will make sense? It could be a, in, it, it, it would be a sort of an in, initiation in India with respect to third party funding. I mean, we're very innovative people. I think it's an interesting concept. A lot of people can't afford their litigation. My concern, and I'm going to put it out there is, what we've been talking about for about an hour is the plethora of possible contractual litigation. And if we were to open the floodgates on third party funding for those, then we're going to be defeating the purpose entirely because we don't, we may or may not have the exact infrastructure to service the. No, that I think not going to happen soon because if uh, investors are not going to put in money unless they see a clear pathway to success, right? The people who put money into third party funding are investors. So if they do not see that this is going to work out, there's no way they're going to give money to anybody. So Ramanuj, I've heard that during COVID, um, gambling has gone up majorly. People are gambling because oh. they don't have the money to gamble. So I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, 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 third party funders are not gamblers. Okay. Uh, there's another interesting, very interesting comment and question. Uh, the situation is very similar to Latin American economies breaking down and failing to protect foreign investment. Here, it's every, uh, it's every economy in similar situation. So do you think India could be uh, you know, uh, like invoking BITs or there will be an increase in bilateral investment with the arbitration? Do I think that, I mean, you know, th this is a really interesting question. Just, just can you repeat it? Do we think that India is going to invoke bilateral investment treaties to do what? To call in the investment uh, no, 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 no. So what happens is, so the kind of disputes that may arise right now is of this nature. So for example, right now there's a lockdown and most of the, let's say most of the world decides to re in, remove lockdown. Okay, they decide that it's already happened in Europe, a large number of countries have started lifting their lockdown, saying that you know it's not working anymore, so let's just lift it. 
Now, imagine that India takes a position that no, we are going to continue with lockdown. Now that this lockdowns can be very well be looked at as uh, you know expropriation events, okay, by the government. Basically, the government not allowing businesses to function. Although there are you know uh, exemptions, but if it comes to be established that lockdown is not an effective mechanism, or the or the government failed to provide basic you know uh, services like you know even even air services are closed down or like you know. When when the rest of the world has kind of plugged back in and one country fails to do so, there's a chance of expropriation and bilateral investment treaty, uh, you know, uh, arbitration. Do you think it is a possible? So, if I'm hearing you correctly, are we thinking of the possibility of intergovernmental litigations or contention? No, it's like, like BIT treaties are like you know investors sue government. Investors, absolutely. So it's basically investors suing the government for the fact that the lockdown is not valid. I think we're asking those questions today itself. We're asking on the validity of the lockdown. The fact of the matter is that this again is, a, when we're looking at a larger solve, we need to start understanding what are just, not that we have to understand it, we will raise our, we will raise our contentions. But what is the ability of a justice system to be able to, solve for this and then the execution again of it. So if the government is, um, if we allow the government to take any action it wants to, even in a democracy, I mean, especially in a democracy, they're answerable for it. It's got to be constitutional, legal, or then an emergency measure, right? right. So we will ask these questions, but do I feel, do I, uh, do I think there's going to be a proliferation? I don't know what I think. I just hope not. And, and there's a possibility, it's not just the lockdown itself, but also how government acted at local level, especially in India, we are seeing like police sometimes, you know, uh, using excessive force on labor, labor, uh, you know, labor, uh, laborers or like, you know, people simply yeah. buying food or ration sometimes are being, you know, attacked and stuff like that. So there may be, uh, these might also lead to possible, you know, harmful impacts on foreign investments and could lead to issues. So that would be an interesting thing. I think it's too early to comment on. It'll all be kind of interesting, but I'm just going to pick up a thread of what you said. Again, I think a lot of the things that are usually rights-based actions, for instance, right? I know we were talking commercially, but I'm now looking rights-based actions. We're going to take large, large, uh, we're going to take positions and they, could, they may or may not be larger uh, litigations on those issues. But I think in times like this, and this is again my personal view, it's not either as a commercial lawyer, it's from my experience when, in seeing communities doing things like mediation and conflict resolution, that there is a time for conflict to create the impact that it's intended to create. So a change or a rights change or a rights affirmation, and it has to be there. And when we're coming out of the pandemic, we're going to be in repair. And during repair, my personal feeling is I don't think that's the place for contention. It's the place for actually resolution. So that's that's my feeling because I, uh, Ramlesh, remember something that I worked as a general counsel, but my larger position is I, I is understanding conflict, right? And it's I mean not larger as in it's my area of interest. It's it's what I do. It's fundamentally what I look at. And that's when you're asking me that I'm not an economist. I'm not a social. I'm any any comments on what happened in other like uh, like for example is this comment pointed out that you know Latin American economics all breaking down at the same time this has happened in the past so what what happened in those cases like we have I, I'm sorry let me get back to you I I again can't just off the top of my head give you give you any but ask Shruti to just get and connect with me I'm intrigued by the question I'd love to answer it I'd like to understand it better. Sure, sure. Sounds great. Actually, something to for all of us to... Yeah, respect. it's something to think about. There are a bunch of questions. We I'll try to quickly take some questions. There were questions mm -hmm. on uh, on the, on some banking things, especially. Let me just check. Uh, uh, lender has discretionary power to grant moratorium to borrower. If the lender does not grant moratorium in that case, will the borrower claim frustration of contract? Can they claim? I don't think so. Borrowers can't claim frustration of contract. I mean, it is not impossible to return the money. How is it impossible? Yeah. Okay. Again, again, such a specific, I mean, 
you know, if I give, I, I can give you the answer and say, yes, they can, right? I'm going to have about 15 judges telling me that you were talking rubbish, right? My point right now is, you're right. Fundamentally, we're in the rules-based. Right now, it's totally a lender's uh, prerogative to de declare mor moratorium. So can he sue for it? No. It's just, it's again, if I was a lender, and I'm not thinking for any bank, because it's going to be all different. I'm going to be thinking, I say no, and then no problem. That becomes my basis. That becomes my basis of um, whatever, my resolution with, with the client. How do I now, how does it, what is the number it goes toward? Does it goes towards the number of my bad debts because the person can't pay? Or does it go towards the possibility of uh, aggregated longer term debt, which has been stretched out and aggregated for, for return? It's, lenders are going to have to look at this. And by the way, I'm very bravely answering your questions. You guys know that finance is the only area I've never been a GC in. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but, but these are practical. These are practical. That's okay. There are more finance questions on <clears throat> can a lender call an event of default under loan agreements as RBI COVID regulatory package circular doesn't restrict this. And, and again, I think the same question, same thing applies. Why would you call it an event of default and, you know, add to your problems when you know that it, it is not the event of default is, uh, called when you want, you know, there are penal interests and forcing that other party into more trouble and recovering their assets and all of that. Yes. So it doesn't make any sense right now. Like you are, you know that you are pushing yourself into a worse place by doing that. So. Yeah. I like what you said, Ramanuj. I think lawyers, because we do, and we are rightly, our job is to focus on the technicality, right? On the technicality, because you will get something that will declare you as the judgment debtor, creditor, and then you will one day win. That's also fine. Because that also is something you can live with. Depending on when you... Because you see, a financial institution is an institution. It's going to outlive, hopefully, a lot of us, right? And our, and our businesses. It's, these are, that's why you have institutions. However, that, that decision, again, is taken on what you just said. What you just said. What sense does it make? It doesn't make sense to to renegotiate every contract it sometimes makes sense to fight the good fight because it's a much larger principle. But my fear is about 70% of it is not going to be on that. It's not going to be possible. That's my crystal ball. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's a question on uh, if there is no dispute resolution clause, okay, can then what happens? Like, can we still do mediation or arbitration? So, Firstly, yes, because parties can uh, agree to go to mediation at the outset. It's a, it's a process that is recognized under the CPC to be sent from the court, as well as if you have a private mediation, the court would in fact very gladly decree it as an agreement that they recognize under the CPC. So it's really a question of you can just about renegotiate your contract and go to the get stamp duty and sign a new contract. Or if it's a very large and complicated matter, people might want to enter into court as a, as a dispute that's already taken place and a conciliation agreement to that dispute. And that is recognized by the court because then that becomes your baseline, not a pre-COVID agreement. It's, it's again about creating your baseline. So if you have very, very interesting situation that I just want to like, this would be like sort of one of the last major questions I asked today and we'll wrap this up after that. Uh, you know, what happens in case you are a negotiator or a mediator and the other party will most of the time say, there's nothing we can do. Like we have no more assets. We are not able to do our any business. Let's just do it. Let, let's just take it forward and see six months down the line what happens. Because right now there's nothing we can do. Or let this thing get over and then we'll renegotiate. Right now, there's nothing to renegotiate. We can only agree that we will take a look at things after the lockdown is lifted. Otherwise, how can I promise you anything else, right? So, how, what is this real, like, you know, if you look at the real problems of mediators and negotiators, what can they really do in this? Area? So, you know, it's, um, okay. If parties are willing or wanting to postpone to an inevitability because they'd like to, let me tell you that's the generic outlook of parties. That's even the generic outlook of people sometimes. Some people 
look at an issue as a wait and watch issue fair enough however in businesses that are facing impending doom that is shut down closure uh you know bankruptcy on account of um a supply chain disruption or a uh, financing disruption or or things that are identifiable in this realm i think renegotiating council at that time would not give this not business advice it's really it's quasi business advice that you're possibly um in a good place to understand your claims today and reinvent if the business's nature is that so in a lot of supply chain issues right there is a possibility that the end of this crisis will see about 30 40% of the market eroding in terms of what exists today the brand they're going to reinvent people are not going to reinvent on their own a lot of this is going to come out of contention or of dispute disputes and conflict will create the possibility of totally new business prototypes and models for those businesses waiting for another day is not going to create that it's the emergent pressure it's it, every single creation comes from its its entire so you have you need to possibly have advice as well as talent to execute that advice that is allowing you to look at the possibilities of going headlong into that conflict now because looking 6 months from now is not a bad thing but again you're going to have to ask yourself the tough questions their business questions and their legal questions limitation will only go for 3 months can i can i not afford this so basically you need really creative mediators really creative uh, negotiators who come up with out of box solutions the world really needs creative people right now ramanuj i like what elon musk said yesterday after very creatively naming his child <laughs> he said that we should have no more financiers and no more lawyers we just need innovators Great. so in order to defy him i think we need very very innovative financiers and lawyers and when i say innovative we've always been innovative we're innovative with structure we're innovative we're innovative to win have, have you for time immemorial we have been innovative to win so you will do debt structuring uh debt and debt restructuring loan restructuring equity cuts mergers there are some council who are doing incredible work but they were winning for one we have interestingly at the back of this crisis a social commercial political geopolitical situation where we need to possibly start thinking a little wider i think the mergers will be more voluntary probably if you are, again as a mediator i i am forced to have that view because it allows me to put parties in a place where they can openly air without a prejudice for the person who's in the center the, the person in the center having a a closed mindset but you're right we really need creative people at this point great so you're almost 15 minutes past uh, past already the time Let's so go. we are going to going to wrap this up so any Thank any you. final parting message before we end the session i i think that was my parting message get creative okay. get creative you're a litigator get creative you're a contracting counsel get creative this is the one time where you will need to be creative i say this whereas when we began this conversation i think it's very clear that lawyers function because we focus well so creativity doesn't mean unfocused it just means get creative in fact creativity needs much more focus much more you know i'll i'll just ask people if they want to have a offline chat they know how to get in touch with me sure so, sure so uh, anybody wants to have a have a long conversation or you want to get in touch with sibon you can do so on linkedin you can look her up on linkedin are you active on linkedin sibon I'm smiling to that question. Okay. They know so how to find. Are. They okay. know how to find me. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. Should I share your email ID or something with them? Yeah, you have my resolve ID. I'll send it to you. Share it, share it with them. Okay, sure. So if you share your email, I'll just circulate it with everybody. Okay. Please do. I'd All be happy right. to. Do that. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank have you a for keeping great up. Great weekend. Rest of the weekend, Sunday is almost over. Yep, thanks for coming on on Sunday and we'll chat soon. All right. Bye. Take care.